Hey there, if you're watching this video, I think this will help you if you are investing in the Singapore stock market. There's a few assets that the Singapore investors, uh, um, they really like it a lot. And I'm going to like sort of like give you some uh, ideas of what I feel as an investor um, in assets around the world. Okay, so let me uh, screen share my, uh, my content. Uh, Something that you need to know that the current climate, right, that we are looking at today is where, uh, giving you some context, Singapore itself, we have released about four packages uh, over a total of 100 billion at this point of time. And it's a very huge amount. Think of it this way. Uh, and uh, on top of that, they have also expanded or extended some of the schemes that they have launched during this, uh, since the ever beginning of the year. So. So I, I, I felt that this is a, a, a insights right into how you should position your assets uh, when it comes to investing in Singapore at this point in time. And these are also something that I prepared for the, the participant in the webinar. Of course, there are more that I will share in the webinar. If you like, you can always join me in my uh, uh, up and coming webinar that I normally conduct uh, every week. Okay. So, let me go straight into it and then you have a better understanding of what I'm talking about at this point. Okay, so the first question that I'm going to ask you right, is, do you think Singapore is one of the top 10 indebted country in the world? Means um, that we have a lot of debt um, as compared to our GDP. What do you all think? Is it a yes or is it no? Do comment in the chat box before I review the answer to you. <clears throat> The answer is actually yes. Singapore is the number seven top indebted country in the world based on this ratio called debt to GDP ratio. So we have about, based on this article, we have about 420 billion US dollar debt. And our GDP is uh, like, like, as the article say, is, is lesser. Okay. And do take note that this does not, cons uh, does not take into the account of the government's financial assets, like our reserve. Okay, so it's also stated at the, at, in, the, in the paragraph on the right. But I just want you to really understand the current situation. Assuming uh, that our GDP is about close to like uh, three to 400 billion USD, and that our government has released close to 20% uh, stimulus package based on our GDP level, then are we, do you think that we are coming out from COVID? Uh, the answer is actually not really. Why? Because as a Singapore as a whole, right? Let's look at it this way. Uh, we are still a very uh, global market. Okay, our airlines are not flying. Um, tourists are not coming in. Likewise, we are not going out. Uh, but because when there is no flow of money uh, into Singapore or coming through Singapore, right? Then uh, we are not able to really grow and or stimulate our economy. So. How long we will need to recover easily about maybe one to two years or even three years based on some of the analyst report that I'm uh, looking at. But I, I just want you to have some comparison. There's this particular country where right? you, you, most of you will think that, wow, the debt level is very high, right? And the country is actually US. And yet you look at US, their GDP to, uh, their debt to GDP is actually lower than us. I do agree with you. Their debt level is as close as 22 trillion based on that article. However, do take note, their, sorry, their debt is about 22.8 trillion, but yet their GDP is about 20 over trillion. So they are a very huge economy by itself in that sense. So that is why naturally, uh, most of you might not understand uh, how, why countries will have such a debt level is very simple. Uh, there's, this, there's this particular formula that you need to understand is 90% of money is based on credit. Okay. What, what do I mean by that? It's like assuming in Singapore, an uh, individual uh, buy a HDB, like a couple buy a HDB of 500,000, what's going to happen is they're going to put in 10% down payment, which is 50,000 50, with HDB, using HDB loan, and they can take up to a 450,000 uh, loan amount. And in, in total, right, it's a 500,000 uh, spending, okay, they buy a property. So that is why, uh, again and again, right, if you are just looking at the stock market, right, you don't really understand how the stock market works. 
what you need to see is the source of the, the, the reason why the stock market is going up and down. So the main reason is really the debt market that drives the economy and then the economy drives the stock market. And why is that so? It's very simple. Okay, uh, do take note, stock market is just public listed company. And the participant in the economy, right, includes you and me, small and medium enterprise, um, and large enterprises, and on top of that, government spending also, right? And each group, like each five groups, right, which is, you know, individuals like you and me, small, medium, large enterprise, and governments, right? Uh, these five groups, right, we are likely to have debt in that sense. Um, and this trend is rising. I just checked the number, right? Like for example, uh, Singapore, I think our debt is even higher at this point. Uh, but again, uh, uh, don't be wary of it, especially in Singapore, because we have a, a reserve uh, amount. Based on some article, uh, they say that our reserve uh, is about 50 billion, sorry, 500 billion to uh, probably $1 trillion. So we, I have, I, we, we don't have the, 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 the public information to this, so I do not want to speculate yet. But the raising concern is very, um, is, is there. Why? Because imagine a country, right, keep uh, drawing their reserve. Or you imagine an individual to keep drawing their reserve. Is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? I think most of you will understand. So, but the thing is, I'm not just talking about that. I'm talking about why, what are the top two investment assets that uh, investors are looking in when they are investing? Think their money in Singapore. And for me, when I realized that the, the debt level of Singaporeans or Singapore government is, or Singapore itself is rising, right? I actually asked myself this very important question. What are the two top investors uh, thinking when they are investing in Singapore? Okay, so guess who, which two companies that I'm referring to. So we start with the letter T and the letter G. So we'll do comment below again before I review it to you. I'm going to pause for a while. Okay. So the answer to that question, right, is very simple. It's actually Tamase and GIC. So ever since I knew this information, which is like in the 2000s period, right? Uh, so this is a, a latest extracted information from Tamase Holding. So you can see from 2004 until 2019, which is last year, you will notice something. The asset allocation based on geography, the amount based on the color didn't really shift a lot, right? But a lot of the assets growth in terms of geographic for the market is what? Overseas assets, right? We grew from 90 billion to all the way to 300 billion. Easily about 26% is close to 60 to $70 billion is uh, Singapore assets. And in, didn't really grow much because back then it was about what 40 over billion go to 70 it's about close to 90 percent but do you notice that the growth in the, the uh, global economy okay went up by many many fold right it's about uh, in 2004 it could be about what uh, 30 over billion but now it's about 200 over billion dollar it's what nine 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 four okay nine x that's the amount of growth that our assets have grown overseas, okay? So what it tells you and me, are they investing heavily in Singapore assets or they are just purely having organic growth? So if you look on the year to year, you have a better understanding of that. I should not get into this information, but it's all public information by the way. And then of course, looking at GIC. So it's, it's the Government Investment Corporation. So likewise, you look at the red box over there, 19% of their money uh, is managing in uh, Asia exclude Japan. So am I right to say that Asia exclude Japan includes Singapore, Hong Kong, China, Taiwan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, like Macau in a way, right? So you see the number, the number of assets that the two institutions are investing in Singapore is uh, not a lot. So my question to you is very simple. If a lot of your money is invested into Singapore assets, then you might go into a thing called concentration risk, which is geographic concentration risk. And should you really do this with your money? I don't really think so. Why? The seven investors around the world, uh, from these two companies, you can see that they are investing not just in Singapore, globally also, okay? Uh, especially uh, around the world. 
Okay, so you can uh, look at some of the assets uh, uh, that they own in their financial statement. Okay, so I'm, but I want to go to the meat of the topic today, okay, which is the top two investments for Singaporeans. So guess, guess which two sector or which two type of uh, assets that people like to invest in Singapore. The first type I want to go straight into it is purely property REITs. So REIT, you know, Real Estate Investment Trust. But why, why I want to pick up this is very, very important. Uh, is uh, recently, like in April, after the pandemic, after the, during the circuit breaker, MES, which is the Monetary Authority of Singapore, actually did three things for them. So the first one is higher uh, leverage limit. So this, this article is, is, is uh, uh, by uh, Sydney. So I want to credit them and I want to use it on my uh, webinar. Okay, you, I will probably put the link in the in the YouTube. You can really read the whole content. Uh, and then on top of that, secondly, they, they increased the minimum coverage ratio. Okay, and likewise, they extended the distributable uh, distribution taxable income. Okay, what it means is very simple. The first one, uh, when they increase the leverage, it means what? They can take more debt. So think of it this way. As an individual, right, what would be a good thing for you? Take more debt or take less debt? Think of it. Okay. Then secondly is they can defer their interest payment to the next few years. So these are like, uh, you know, like, you know, people when they have credit card debt, right? They cannot pay it, right? Then you go into restructuring, right? So what, what, what do you think about companies uh, in the REITs industry? Uh, and MES has enabled them to defer all the way right to 2020. So, uh, so questionable is that will these REITs uh, companies uh, might not, uh, might not, uh, might be suffering in the next coming two to three years, like this year and the next two years. And then on top of that, the, the REITs amount, like the taxable income, right, they will um, distribute to shareholders right, at the later period of time. So again, if it's a very good paying company, like good paying dividends company, right? Uh, are they supposed to extend the payment period or are they going to increase? Right? Don't, don't, don't just buy because uh, they are REITs, uh, uh, the, the yield ratio is very high. You need to understand the investment assets that you are putting in. Uh, if you're going to study a bit more, right? The dividend yield uh, ratio, right? Is basically the uh, yield that they pay divided by the share price. And most company like in the REITs market, right? They are high, they are having higher uh, dividend yield, right? It's not purely because they have better renters, uh, they have uh, more tenants, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it is purely because the share price, which is the denominator uh, of the formula, the, the, the dividend ratio, right? Um, or dividend yield ratio, right? Uh, the share price actually dropped dramatic, uh, dropped a lot. That is why the ratio on the uh, on the dividend yield actually went up a lot. So really understand all this. Uh, it might be a bit technical. So uh, do really go and do your own due diligence. Never never invest purely because the yield is high. Okay. Uh, even if the yield is high or low, right? You really need to dive deeper into it. Uh, was it high because there were more business? There were more cash flow. Uh, their business is more profitable. Uh, things like this. And I think in the morning, I was even uh, watching uh, CN, CNA, China News Asia news where um, the, the property developers are in a watch list now. Not say watch list, they, they, are, they are thinking, so-called the, the Ministry of uh, National Development are looking at how they can give them some leeway, uh, like, like uh, assuming those properties are TOP, they are supposed to buy, buy the company into if they are not able to sell within that, that, that that, that period of time and that would incur additional buyer stamp duty uh, on the developer side. I think uh, there's a lot of uh, heat on the developer. So and again, is when the developer having a lot of heat, do also understand that a lot of the developer has uh, reads themselves. So it will uh, one way or the other affect one another, right? So there might be a lot of consolidation in the property industry uh, in Singapore. Okay, the second thing that I want to, um, People always like right is basically the banks, right? So the banks in Singapore, the top three local banks, uh, over this period of time, uh, just to give you some background to it, US have lowered their interest rate close to zero, which is a range from zero to zero point two five percent, 
And what happened after that in March or April? Very simple. Singapore three local banks start cutting their high yield interest rate in April. Uh, and then one of them uh, in June start cutting again. In July, um, the other two local banks start to cut. Uh, all, all these are public information, but it's more where you need to be aware of the investments that you are doing. And in I think this, this today, I think OCBC or like last month, OCBC said that they are going to cut the high yield interest uh, accounts again, saving accounts again. So um, I want to make a prediction. Most likely, the other two banks are going to follow suit too. Okay. So what, what, what are the MES call on banks, right? So likewise, this is from Sydney. I want to credit them. Uh, they make it very clear for you. And uh, it's a very good platform for uh, investors to look at. But very simple, they ask the local banks to cap their this year's dividend to 60% of last year's amount, purely because they want them to protect their balance sheet. They want them to uh, be able to create a buffer for them in the years to come. And true enough, right? I mean, think of it this way: the bank's real business, right, is really uh, earning uh, money from the interest that they are charging you. However, the interest rate environment at this moment will be very low. Um, a lot of analysts are looking at interest rate will be as low as zero in US, all the way to twenty twenty three, or even all the way to twenty twenty five. Okay, and gi to give you some background, right? Uh, in the last financial crisis, right, the interest rate environment have went very low for at least a five to six years period. Okay, and do understand uh, the COVID nineteen crisis, right? It is coined as the greatest uh, crisis of our time. So, the close to zero interest rate environment might be even longer than that. So, just to give you some context and really let you understand where this two type of investment. Uh, do you want to add into position? Okay, end of the day, my work is to make sure that I can educate you to understand the risk you are taking when you are looking at these two, uh, um, two investments. Cool. Okay, but of course, lastly, right, uh, do like this video if you think that is helpful. Do help me to share and also follow my YouTube channel. Do subscribe and turn on the notification bell in, in the event where there are new content coming your way. So please help me to share to more of your friends who need to hear this message. Cool. Bye-bye.